What makes a terrorist organisation successful? Extreme views or the ability to recruit high numbers of dedicated and malleable followers? These might be contributing factors, but what it really boils down to is money. Joining me now down the line is Loretta Napoleoni, one of the leading experts on terrorist financing. And in the studio is financial barrister William Wilson. Well, Loretta, if I might start with you, terrorism, could it be described as a business? Oh, absolutely. It is a very, very expensive business. And it's also a business which is very hard uh, to keep rolling uh, because most of the activities that terrorist organizations carry on in order to fund themselves are illegal or criminal activities. What sort of figures are we looking at and how much does it cost to finance a terrorist organization? Well, terrorist organization is very expensive. It is, in reality, an organization that is waging war against the state. It's very difficult to give a figure to the amount of money. Some terrorist organizations can generate vast amount of money. In the case of PLO, in the 1990s, according to the CIA, the turnover of this organization range between 8 to $12 billion. So we're talking about more money. There was the GDP of countries like Jordan, for example. What's the most significant source of terrorist financing? Well, in the past, the smuggling of drugs and people was the number one revenue for a terrorist organization. Things have changed since the rise to power of the Islamic State. It is a completely different model of terrorist financing. Before 9-11, about one-third of the money that terrorist organization generated came from legitimate businesses. The PLO actually controlled the production of textile from the occupied territories in Palestine and used those money, those revenues, you know, to fund its terrorist organization. So one third is roughly what it was before 9-11. But today, in the case of the Islamic State, the so-called legitimate business is actually much more than one third. Some of the aid near the borders in Turkey, in Iraq, and in Kurdistan, part of that aid is taxed by the Islamic State, which controls those borders. Same we can say about the oil field. The Islamic State is in business with the local tribes in Syria in order to sell the oil uh, to the Damascus government. William, do you have anything to add? In terms of the sort of rising star of international terrorism, the Islamic State, we've got a completely new situation here where we have a terrorist organisation that's basically taken over the second largest city in Iraq. Reports say that their raid on the large bank in Mosul has pocketed them $430 million. Well, that's quite a lot of money to hold in cash. It's not something we've ever really seen in international terrorism before, the ready access to that amount of cash. When you couple that, again, with them holding 35% of territory, they've now got all of the oil fields in the north of Syria. There are lorries full of oil going into Turkey. There are all of the antiquities that are held in the Middle East. Uh, there seems to have been quite a large outflow of them, again raising tens of millions of dollars. There are suddenly just new sources of cash, and that's a very terrifying prospect and a very difficult thing to counter. Well, Loretta, do you think economies could perhaps indirectly benefit from terrorism, especially considering the new calculations on GDP, which will include arms sales, drugs and prostitution. Oh, absolutely. The best example is Italy, where Italy is part of the pigs, you know, which are you know, in serious economic uh, troubles because of uh, the crisis of the 2010. And among these countries, Italy is the one uh, that has done uh, the best uh, because a large part, maybe even 40% you know, of the GDP of Italy is produced by the black market. Uh, and the black market is controlled by organized crime. So we have a criminal economy uh, which is sustained um, strongly the legitimate economy. Well, William, what's the penalties for financing or investing in terrorist organizations or those affiliated with terrorism? In this country, it's obviously regarded as a criminal activity. Um, so the terrorist legislation here says that if you either have knowledge or a reasonable suspicion that a particular batch of money has been used for the purposes of raising terrorism, that creates a criminal offence. The state has search and seizure powers so it can stop actual flows of money as they are sort of flowing out to fund terrorist activities. Part of the problem that we face in trying to clamp down on these organisations is that they're treated differently in different places. Uh, part of the reason for that is that uh, different people define terrorism differently. Uh, for some people, 
what they would call terrorism is for other people what they'd just call politics or involvement in uh, foreign politics in other arenas. Well, William, a comment piece in the FT said that financial secrecy supports networks that fuel terrorism, criminality and tax evasion. If companies were forced to be more transparent, what would be the impact on terrorism? We traditionally associate the funding of terrorism coming from shady places, often offshore jurisdictions which have very light touch regulation where banking secrecy law is very very prominent and therefore the sort of ultimate depositor customer their identity is ultimately masked. But at the same time it is true to say that that situation has changed quite a lot in the last decade. A lot of the jurisdictions that I work in, the Cayman Islands, Dubai, the British Virgin Islands, Gibraltar have all sort of enacted tough legislation and their regulators are now taking this sort of thing a lot more seriously. You're not seeing so much money in the terrorist economy coming from sources like that. The terrorists always seem to be one step ahead of the game. Um, and uh, they're now, now, now resorting to different tactics and different places. I think we're going to be seeing the sort of geography of that shift away to other places. I think Central Asia is the next big one and also certain states in Africa. William, Loretta. Thank you. Thanks a lot.